if you study the history of the Mediterranean fronts of World War II, one story you can't avoid is that of the gladiators of Malta. Three planes, Faith, Hope, and Charity, that stood alone against the Italian Regia Aeronautica in defense of Malta. It's an uplifting story, pun very much intended, to be sure, and one that is actually well reported, even if the details are often embellished or flat out wrong. The core of the tale, however, is very much true. These obsolete biplanes were the only defense of Malta for some time, and did do their duty well, suffering only one recorded loss in air-to-air -air combat. This is no mean feat considering the opposition they were facing. Now, some background first. The island of Malta was a strategic port in the Mediterranean, sitting between Sicily and the North African coast. Furthermore, considering the island's position in the middle of the Mediterranean, it was a crucial linchpin in British control of the sea. With Malta, they had a somewhat secure route between the major bases of Gibraltar and Alexandria. Without Malta, that route would be cut clean in two, and the two bases would have to be supplied separately, be it from the Atlantic or the Suez Canal. As one could expect, the British military considered it of strategic importance they hold Malta. As one could perhaps also expect, this was not exactly an easy thing to do. Leaving aside how many resources were needed for other fronts when World War II kicked off, the location of Malta made any real defense difficult. So close to Italy, so far from British bases and all that. The French even suggested selling the island to Italy as a bribe for Italian neutrality. It was recognized how difficult it was to defend. Churchill vetoed this, which for British purposes is probably a good thing. Italy wasn't going to be paid off by one island, no matter how much they wanted that island. However, when Italy did enter the war, the sum total of Maltese air defenses amounted to a handful of created biplanes. The Gloucester Gladiator, more specifically the Sea Gladiator variant, which was obsolescent at best, and more likely obsolete. Designed in 1934, first flown in 1937, and very outdated by 1940. Capable of only somewhere between 250 to 260 miles per hour, depending on the specific plane, they were slower than even the average Italian bomber. Italian monoplane fighters very much outperformed them. Even Italian biplane fighters arguably outperformed them. Still, with classic British stubbornness, the defenders of Malta set to it. The gladiators, left behind by HMS Glorious and stripped down from an initial stock of 18 due to the need of other fronts, were assembled. Sources vary on how many were put together for flight duty, ranging from 4 to 6 in most accounts but never more than six. What these accounts almost universally agree on, however, is that no more than three were ever used at a single time with the others as spares, be they spare flyable planes or spare parts for repairs. This was done partially down to needing to preserve resources, but also because of a lack of trained pilots. Malta was not exactly brimming with Royal Air Force pilots in 1940. In fact, one of my favorite parts of this story is the idea that most of the pilots were hastily trained seaplane and scout pilots who volunteered to fly the old biplanes, with only one of the six of them actually trained on the Gladiator. I imagine he was quite busy training everyone else to fly the thing. Regardless, these biplanes were put up as the only defense the island had. Regardless, these biplanes were put up as the only defense the island had. Better to have something than nothing and their great morale-boosting power cannot be understated. Even if only three could fly at any given time, that was three more than zero. And for ten days that first June, they were all Malta could muster. And when you have nothing, anything makes you feel better. This is where the story gets a bit conflicted, though. Those gladiators, the six planes that tend to only be recognized as three, were nicknamed Faith, Hope, and Charity. The conflicting nature of this comes in, where did the nicknames actually come from? There's multiple stories of this, and a lot of it's myth and legend at this point. 
Some say that the names were applied after the battle was already over, generally said to be by a Maltese newspaper. At that point, it would have really only been for propaganda value. There's two other sources that come to mind, however, for this being a name attached to the planes. The first is that an officer named John Waters named them from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. The second, and definitely more romantic of the two, is that an RAF corporal named Harry Kirk saw them flying over Valletta and compared them to the hearts on a brooch that belonged to his mother. Those hearts named, you've probably guessed it, Faith, Hope, and Charity. It's a bit foggy on the truth here, but then again it also doesn't terribly matter. Regardless of how they picked up their now famous nicknames, the planes did do real duty, and quite a lot of it. They stood alone for 10 days against the Regia Aeronautica, chasing bombers faster than them, and dogfighting with both monoplanes and, interestingly enough, other biplanes. The skies over Malta in those early days were one of the last places where biplane fought biplane, the gladiators against Italian fiats. This was actually a fairly even match, all told. The Italian CR-42 was faster than the Gladiator, as I mentioned earlier, though the British plane carried heavier firepower, and Gladiators were actually very tough to shoot down. It's interesting, though, that the one Gladiator that was shot down in air-to-air -air combat, that being Charity, was shot down by an Italian biplane. All his monoplanes couldn't do it, but a biplane did. As inspiring and uplifting as the story is, however, the Gladiator stood alone for only a little while. Late in June, the first hurricanes started to arrive, and while the gladiators continued to be pressed into service for some time to come, Malta was always short of aircraft, those who have watched my Ranger video will remember this, they weren't alone by this point. They had done their duty, and now the more modern monoplanes could pick up the slack, for the most part. The gladiators had fended off the might of Italy, made the Italians bleed, and given the Maltese hope. This was more than could have been asked to planes left behind as an afterthought due to their obsolete nature. As for what happened to those planes in the end? Well, as established, Charity was shot down. We'll get back to her in a bit. Hope was destroyed in an air raid in February 1941 on the ground. Faith would be the sole survivor, though there is some evidence that the plane is cobbled together from more than one gladiator of the three. Or six, to be more accurate. The fuselage remains on display in Malta to this day, albeit lacking wings and the more distinct modifications she once had. That is, because the British were quite capable of kitbashing when needed, sticking the engine and propeller from a bomber onto the plane, immediately recognizable by the three-bladed prop instead of the more standard two-bladed one. The other gladiators are more of an open question. No one seems quite sure what happened to them, though a couple were taken over in mid-1941 by a different squadron. Exactly what happened to them and the other spares is largely unknown past this point. As for Charity, I found a couple articles, and I'll link one of them in the description, mentioning plans in 2021 to rebuild the plane found off the coast of Malta. Though, to be more accurate, it'd be more a new plane based on Charity, than rebuilding the plane itself to flightworthy condition. Still, the idea of any flyable gladiator is a nice one to a warbird historian, so I can hardly blame them for playing it up a bit. That's where the story of the Malta gladiators ends, though, at least as a broad overview of their feats. A handful of brave pilots in tough planes against overwhelming odds, giving hope in one of the darkest parts of the Second World War. It's a story that is worth remembering, to be sure. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.